The Second Crusade has failed, but its end will open the door to the Plantagenets, that brilliant, avaricious, rebellious, murderous family that will dominate the history of Western Europe for a century to come. Here's their story, so riveting that we still are fascinated by it 900 years later. Welcome back to Lion's Forge. My name is Beckett, and I want to tell you a story, an epic, true story of five kings and the Lion Queen. Season 2, Episode 11, Going Their Separate Ways. So the French finally, suddenly, had their royal baby boy. After 28 years and three wives, Louis Capet had finally produced the next king of France. The baby was named Philip, after his great-grandfather Philip I, he who so loved Bertrand de Montfort and was at once popularly nicknamed Dieu Donné, God Given. Henry's people looked to their king to rally them in light of this alarming news, but Henry didn't leave the pleasant environs of Oxford. He had gone there to lick his wounds after his failed war in Wales, relieving his emotions by turning on two dozen of his captives, the children of Welsh princes. It wasn't pretty. The boys were reportedly blinded and castrated, while their sisters were viciously disfigured by having their noses cut away. He did not go to Eleanor when she gave birth to a baby, their third daughter and seventh child, named Joan, God's Grace. The royal couple did not even spend the Christmas holidays together, the one aspect of Plantagenet family life that could be counted upon from one year to the next. His interest in that life was fading, and at least part of the reason was a teenaged girl named Rosamund Clifford. At the age of 32, despite all the whoring done with and yet to come, Henry Plantagenet had fallen in love, probably for the only time in his life. The exact date Rosamund met Henry, like other facts of her life, is obscure. Her father was a local baron, Walter de Clifford, master of Clifford Castle, which stood en route to the battlefields of Wales. At some point in Henry's messy dealings with the Welsh, very possibly that jumbled summer and fall of 1165, Henry accepted the Clifford's hospitality. Rosamund was one of three Clifford girls. The royal eye lit upon this particular one, evidently lovely, with a fresh, unjaded charm. We know virtually nothing about fair Rosamund, aside from the bare facts of her existence, her presumed dewy beauty, and Henry's enthralled desire for her, which uncharacteristically lasted until her death a decade later. Whatever wit, intelligence, grace, and joie de vivre she possessed that brought a bored, debauched man to his knees, we can't define. The new royal mistress was soon moved to a handsome life in the countryside west of London, installed at the Royal Lodge at Woodstock, one of Henry's favorite places. We can guess how quickly the Cliffords got richer. Not to mention how quickly the river of gossip carried word of Henry's besotted love affair back to his wife. No one knows how often the new lovers were together. Absence may have been the heat that fueled their passion. One historian called Rosamond one of the most neglected concubines in history, being of the opinion that Henry was apart from her most of the decade she was his mistress. Given his life spent eternally in motion, from the day they met, Henry was away far more than he was with his poor beauty. During one memorable stretch that ended in 1170, he was on the wrong side of the channel for four solid years. Their mutual adoration was apparently heightened by such monumental separation, 
since they survived as a couple long enough for the chronicler Gerald of Wales to write that Henry, long a secret adulterer, now flaunted his paramour for all to see. There are so many legends and fables, not only about Rosamund and Henry, but also about Rosamund and Eleanor, two women who never met in life. Contrary to myth, Rosamund probably didn't bear Henry any children, nor did he build a labyrinth for her, whether to amuse her, guard her from other men, or defeat the murderous intentions of a queen maddened by jealousy. Rosamund did not die by Eleanor's hand, a story that began two hundred years after all the players were in their graves. But it's not hard to imagine that Eleanor wished Rosamund Clifford strangled at the bottom of a well every bit as passionately as Henry wished Thomas Becket gone from the face of the earth. God knows Henry had never been a faithful husband, but never before had he been so publicly, so obviously, so steadfastly in love. No famously bewitching woman, among whose ranks Eleanor had always been included, simply gives up her claims to adoration, deference, and passion. Eleanor herself had been the reigning teenaged beauty at the French court thirty years before, while Louis Capet's mother, worn from multiple pregnancies, was shuffled off to the side. Now Eleanor herself was over forty, delivered of ten childbeds, near the end of her valued fertile years, a decade older than her wandering spouse. Instead, she was about to be a grandmother. The oldest of all her children, Marie, her first daughter with Louis, would soon give birth to her own first child. Achieving old age was rare good fortune in 1165, but the prospect of living it unloved and ignored was no happier then than it is now. For ten years, as her forties passed, Eleanor would hear all the gossip about her unseen rival, speculate about Henry's absences, and endure his increasing indifference. She was no longer his great love. They were no longer the most glorious couple in Western Europe. Like Thomas Becket, once her rival for Henry's affections, Eleanor of Aquitaine would now forever move away, away, and away from Henry Plantagenet. So there was only one more baby, born on Christmas Eve Day 1167, after the laying in was hastily diverted from Woodstock. The little boy was named John. If there had been anything like a Plantagenet family album that Christmas, it would have shown 34-year-old Henry gazing absently off after his Rosamond, while Eleanor, now 43, looked upon her tribe of children, young Henry, age 12, Richard, 10, Geoffrey, 9, Eleanor, 5, Joan, just past her second birthday, and newborn John. Their eldest daughter, 11-year-old Matilda, would be missing from the frame, having left England a few months earlier to marry the Lion of Saxony. The picture would include young Henry's very young wife, the French Princess Marguerite, not yet ten. The parents of this large and busy brood would not be smiling fondly at each other. By now, Henry and Eleanor, the great power couple of Western Europe, lived on entirely different planes. He was often away, often at war. His affections were given to the Clifford girl. And one has to give the man credit. His detailed, almost microscopic attention to matters in his kingdom can astonish, especially given what we consider hopelessly primitive methods of communication and record-keeping. Let inquiry be made about the king's property, whether the buildings are enclosed with ditches and hedges as the Lord King commanded. There were in the village only sixteen ploughs at that time, and now they testify that there are twenty-eight, so the village has been improved to a value of more than forty marks of silver. 
Through Walter of Sapperston's mismanagement, the Lord's hay crop perished. When he wasn't pursuing justice in the matter of a ruined hay crop, Henry wrestled endlessly with rebellion in his continental lands, with pleas for help from warring kings in Ireland, with ways to dependably raise tax revenue, with the threats of excommunication and interdict from the unbowed fugitive Thomas Becket. As Henry could spare the time, he sought comfort from his beautiful Rosamond thirty years younger than his wife. We want to believe that Henry Plantagenet could love, but there is no way to know it. His constancy to his rose is the only evidence we have, with no way to parse whether it was made of a great love for her or a great fury toward the woman he had married. In contrast, Eleanor's life had recently revolved around outfitting daughter Matilda for her wedding in a manner suited to the daughter of the exalted Henry of England. The king had a special right to extra taxes upon the marriage of his eldest daughter, which Henry was not shy about demanding. One calculation is that this single levy amounted to a quarter of the kingdom's normal annual revenue and took years to collect. Eleanor used the ocean of money to buy her daughter furs, tapestries, candles, books, dogs, wines, falcons, silver trays, leather gloves, and packing chests to carry it all. The entire entourage of prepubescent bride and her English and German servants, envoys, tutors, confessors, ladies-in-waiting, and musicians, along with the queen, six months pregnant, sailed from Dover. Kisses were exchanged. Eleanor was soon gone, back to Oxford. The princess, in all her splendor, would be married the next spring, in the year 1168. Neither her father nor her mother would be present. In what might be thought an ill omen for a new bride, they would be busily engaged in going their separate ways. At some point after John's birth at Christmas, 1167, Eleanor swept through her residence at Winchester and packed up the lot. It took seven royal transports to carry the queen and her belongings across the channel. Rather like Rosamond Clifford, Eleanor would only occasionally spend time with Henry for the rest of her life. She settled herself in her ancestral bastion, Poitiers, where Henry's ambitions, like Henry's bed, were no longer hers. Her separate household in Poitiers was that of a happily restored sovereign. Eleanor had hereditary ties to the Aquitaine that neither Louis Capet nor Henry Plantagenet could pretend to equal. Every Aquitanian noble had sworn a vow of personal fealty to her. She could in turn offer her vassals financial largesse, relief from taxes, restoration of old dignities. There's little question that she ruled. We have more than a dozen charters issued in her own right after her return, while Henry, the greatest king in Western Europe, apparently gave up an active role in Aquitanian affairs. Aquitanian taxes were paid to him, and he had practical control of the duchy's military forces, but he played less and less of a role in Aquitanian government. It was Eleanor's court that was now the center of power in the Aquitaine re-establishing rituals that had lagged for decades while she had been absorbed in a life lived in Paris, London, Rouen, Anjou. Now the great old families, along with new ones on the rise, flocked back to the Aquitaine's ancient center. Men who held grudges against her husband, whether due to his taxes, his aggressions, his laws, or his treatment of the Archbishop of Canterbury, were happily offered the hospitality of the place. Yet she was still married, and married to an exceptionally powerful man. Her husband was entirely mindful of what she might be capable of, not least because she was still the sworn vassal of none other than her former husband, the King of France. 
Henry accordingly placed his distant queen under the local protection of Patrick, Earl of Salisbury. The Earl's role would have been a delicate balance of guide and guardian for his queen, household informant for his king. Like many of Henry's favorites, Salisbury was from an old English-Norman family. Born a commoner, he became an Earl thanks to the Plantagenets during the Anarchy and was about to die at the hands of the Lusignan family, the roughhouse Poitevin barons who loved rebellion and enthusiastically smashed into rivals. The old story is that he was escorting Eleanor and her household when they were attacked. Newer research believes he was simply traveling with his retinue through Lusignan territory. Whichever is true, the Lusignan got Salisbury, a shocking event in an era when nobles rarely died in battle, and wounded his teenage nephew, William Marshall. We need to remember this young man, described in a chronicle as fighting the Lusignan ambush so aggressively that it was said he took six horsemen down before he was wounded and captured. Eleanor apparently heard the story, thought highly of his courage, and ransomed the young warrior herself. He would go on to become a famous warrior and a Plantagenet favorite, one who would factor in the family's lives for decades to come. Eleanor's home also became something of a royal hotel obviously at her invitation. Despite the scandals that surrounded her, she was entrusted with the education and safekeeping of many of the children of Mark west of the Rhine and north of the Pyrenees. Aristocratic children typically lived with their fathers, or, in the case of boys, with other prominent lords and, as we've seen, girls betrothed into family would leave their homes to be raised by their fathers-in-law. However, the Plantagenet children seemingly lived for long periods with their mother. Whatever their marital discord, Henry evidently was not opposed to his estranged queen playing a major role in raising their younger sons, along with his bastard Geoffrey. Richard was most often with her. Given his destiny to rule her country, his inheritance publicly recognized when he did homage to Louis Capet for the Aquitaine, at the age of eleven. Infant John, on the other hand, who would go on to a monstrous reputation, has to be singled out as getting little maternal attention. Eleanor's last child, for reasons we don't yet understand, was apparently placed at Fontevrault when he was just a toddler and spent the next five years there. As for Eleanor's French relations, She'd never been allowed much contact with her two daughters with Louis Capet while they were growing up without her. By now, however, two of his younger girls, Princess Marguerite and Elise, were the consorts of the oldest Plantagenet boys. Marguerite was already married to young Henry. Elise promised to Prince Richard. Rather than living at Henry's court, the princesses apparently spent years with Eleanor's household. Another fiancé, little Constance of Brittany, engaged to Prince Geoffrey, also lived with Eleanor. Eleanor's daughter Matilda and her ill-starred Henry the Lion would be forced to come home to mother to roost, notably after the lion ran afoul of his cousin the emperor in 1166 and was exiled. The bustle and clangor of her own household had to give Eleanor pleasure. The time in Poitiers, after she withdrew from Henry and before their greatest battle began, must have been one of her better times. She especially had Richard, her favorite child, the heir to the Aquitaine. She took him with her as often as both were able, traveling across the countryside to receive their vassals, confirm town charters, make gifts of gold to monasteries, promote new marketplaces, and smile at banquets. What was her world like? One historian writes that summers were dry, droughts meaning scanty crops, while winters without central heating, readily available transportation, or grocery stores 
would have been very hard regardless of your status. Of course, there was manure repeatedly trod into the dirt, privy pots flung from windows, people who wouldn't take baths for months at a time, fleas and flies, bad teeth, weathered faces, an unnerving array of scars and missing body parts. Those scars and body parts might have been all too obvious. Peasants went naked in the summer. Graham Robb, in his wonderful book The Discovery of France, points to what he describes as the poor soil, bad weather, gales, hailstorms, fire and floods, wolves, cold and famine that made life for the majority a sad and sorry experience. He recounts a riveting image drawn from a Frenchman alive centuries later, who in the late 1800s remembered his mother plucking fleas from his dead sister's head. But the variety of it all must have been a sight. Shoes with curled toes, nuns in wimples, ladies with cascades of hair caught in silver combs under fine linen veils, king's officers in tunics marked with the rampant lions of the Plantagenet, horses jingling with bells and tassels, emissaries from Spain with their tanned faces and lovely saddles, monks in gray robes, a bishop in purple carried in his swaying litter by sweating footmen, and so many colors everywhere, astonishingly vivid yellows from a plant called weld, the difficult and costly blues, soft mossy greens that owed their gloss to a nice shot of urine in the mix, pinks and reds from madder. In Eleanor's day, birds were popular pets, from songbirds to crows and cranes. Falcons of all kinds were such status symbols that people gave them names and took them everywhere. You wouldn't have gone a block without seeing at least a few riding proudly, if restlessly, on someone's padded arm, whether a monk's, a lady's, or a baker's. Animals filled streets and fields, and people loved their favorite household beasts just as we do. There's a story recounted by historian Robert Bartlett that one proud owner went out every night to visit his faithful oxen, running his hand along their backbones with warm encouragement, instructing each by its own name to eat. Owners bragged about the intelligence, fortitude, beauty, and devotion of their horses. Lapdogs were probably little less spoiled by doting ladies than their descendants are today. Some abbeys had pet deer fed by hand. There are royal records of the costs of maintaining the monarch's leashed bear, along with various lions, leopards, lynxes, camels, and even a porcupine, gifts from nobles at home and abroad who hoped such exotic offerings would gain Henry's favor. Church bells would ring all day long, marking off the hours, music for the years. And gardens were all around you if rather less tidy than our own. Housers were crowded, and the gardens, accordingly small, filled with vegetables, of course, but also with lovely-smelling cooking herbs and with trusted medicinals, hollyhocks to help with cough, peppermint to soothe upset stomachs, rosemary to revive tired blood. These useful plants would grow cheek by jowl with beloved roses and lilies, and with all the plants used for dyes, some of which we wouldn't even recognize, like weld, woad, and matter. Vines of ivy and wisteria climbed sun-warm stone walls. One lovely little drawing of the day shows half a dozen people, including quite a distinguished gentleman in handsome robes, using stepping stones to make their way across a nicely-sized walled garden bending down to observe the pleasing sight of lots of sturdy little green shoots. Then there were the hovering presence of remarkable creatures missing from our duller modern world. People of that time would swear they'd seen angels making their lustrous way through the streets, tall, beardless, and winged. You could occasionally come upon a unicorn, or a sad, 
persecuted werewolf. Beautiful human ladies drew the attention of fawns, the lechers of the spirit world. Under the right conditions, hawks became handsome knights, and vice versa. Sailors came back from sea having heard mermaids sing. Little Portuni sat at the fires toasting frogs, their favorite snack. They tended to like humans and would help around the house. But they did have a bad habit of running a horse into a bog if they found a rider alone in the night. Their relatively good nature set them apart from the uniformly bad temper follets, who threw the household trash around and cut holes in valuable linens for entertainment. But at least they weren't the horrid Drax, who stole little children and didn't bring them back. As if life wasn't complicated enough, actual devils were alarmingly hard to evade. No less than the Count of Anjou had innocently married a beauty who turned out to be Satan's daughter. Artists tried to alert people as to what devils looked like, drawing their enormous ears, feathered wings, claws, and shaggy pelts. Because humans were being alerted to their features, devils trying to get things done on Earth were often forced to assume the shape of pets, of oxen, and even, embarrassingly, mice. Despite their evident successes on that score, they still must have found stays on Earth exasperating. One took pained offense at how ugly he looked in a drawing and argued heatedly with the artist. Then, there was the sea man caught in fishing nets off Suffolk. He ate nothing but raw fish and didn't care anything about churches. The townspeople tried to make him talk by hanging him upside down and torturing him, a bit of scientific experimentation that speaks to a sad lack of empathy in the 12th century mind, while yet displaying admirable curiosity about how things work. As we'll see in the next episode, life was changing, from castles to carrots and the fated marriage of Eleanor of Aquitaine and Henry Plantagenet was about to burst into flame. We've come to the end of our story for the time being. I am Beckett Arnold, narrating from the book Lion's Forge, adapted for us by the author, Karen Markle Knapp. Thank you to Frances Butt for voicing our introduction and offering her voice to others. If you like what you hear, please give us a rating, follow our channel, and share us with your friends. Most importantly, please join us again April 29th for the next episode of Lion's Forge, available everywhere you get your favorite podcasts, including on YouTube with video episode trailers. Visit us on Facebook, where you can ask questions, leave reviews, and interact with me. Until next time, thank you for listening.